The greatest spy in MI6 history is not James Bond, but actually a KGB colonel you've probably never heard of, Oleg Gordievsky. And today, I'll be telling you not only his story, but also how MI6's greatest ever rescue mission to save him went down. Born in Moscow on the 10th of October 1938, Gordievsky's life was entirely shaped by the KGB. His father, Anton Gordievsky, and elder brother Vasily Gordievsky were NKVD officials, which later became the KGB. Since his youth, language and history subjects had been fascinating to him. However, being born during the peak of the Great Purge in Russia, Gordievsky was made to learn the principles of communism at school. This, coupled with his father's relentless fixation on the KGB and lack of any moral compass, failed to nurture a sense of humanity within the young Gordievsky. He was a bright student, leaving school with knowledge of the German language, a silver medal, and as the head of the Komsomol, a youth division of the Communist Party. At 17, he enrolled at the prestigious Moscow State Institute of International Relations, where he studied economics, geography, history, and international affairs. Although Gordievsky knew his life would be dedicated to serving the Soviet Union, either through the intelligence service or the foreign office, his entry into the system was purely unintentional. His brother Vasily, who was undergoing training to become an illegal spy, mentioned his brother's potential interest in the service to KGB officials. So, as a result, Gordievsky found himself participating in an interview that was conducted in German. And thus, by one swift stroke of fate, he was initiated into the dangerous realm of espionage. In August 1961, he was posted to East Berlin as a German translator in the Russian embassy. He watched as the infamous Berlin Wall was erected by the East German government to prevent citizens from fleeing to the democratic West and witnessed how citizens trying to flee were oppressed and shot by the administration in East Berlin. This deeply shocked him, leading to his disillusionment with the Soviet system. It was a significant moment in his life, possibly the catalyst to his shift in beliefs. In 1963, he officially joined the KGB and chose his first spy name, Gwadietsev. Although he wanted to follow in his brother's footsteps and serve as a spy, Gordievsky was given a desk assignment in Moscow where he was tasked with producing forged documents for fellow spies to conceal their identities. It wasn't until January 1966 that he was finally given his first mission as a handler for operatives and posted to the Soviet embassy in Copenhagen, Denmark. He relocated with his wife, Yelena Akopian, a fellow KGB officer. At his new post, he operated under the cover of a consulate official dealing with visas. But the difference between Soviet Moscow and lively Copenhagen couldn't have been more pronounced. For the first time, he got to experience the true benefits of Western democracy, particularly the wealth of literature that was either banned or simply inaccessible in the Soviet Union. This was something that greatly fueled his decision to change his view on Soviet ideologies. And after the USSR's invasion of Czechoslovakia by Russia here in 1968, any remaining allegiance he felt towards his homeland or his father's cherished KGB easily transformed into anger. It was at this moment that Gordievsky decided he had had enough and initiated contact with the Danish security services, knowing very well that the phone inside the embassy in Copenhagen had been bugged by the Danish intelligence service. He went ahead and called his wife and explicitly expressed his anger toward the Soviet system, which was considered a signal of intent. Fortunately or unfortunately, his initial attempt went unnoticed. Two years later, in 1970, it was time for him to head back to the USSR, which had become even more oppressive. He suffered from social isolation because of the unhappy atmosphere that loomed over his motherland. But luckily, three years later, two events prompted his return to Denmark. The first was the expulsion of 105 Soviet spies from Great Britain, labelled as Operation Foot, which resulted in a need to rebuild KGB presence in the various embassies. The second was the untimely death of his brother Vasily at age 39 due to chronic alcoholism. He arrived at the Russian embassy in Copenhagen in October 1972 as the second secretary. However, his primary unofficial duties were to identify, recruit and handle Danes who would sell or trade information and state secrets to the Soviet Union. 
At the airport, his visa had been cleared by the Danish officers intentionally in consultation with MI6. It's therefore safe to note that by now, the Danish and British intelligence services had already taken a keen interest in him. This was after Gordievsky's old university friend, who had become a Russian military translator that defected, had named him among those open to approach by Western spies because he had expressed blatant disappointment in the Soviet system. After two unsanctioned meetings with the British intelligence head of the station, Richard Bromhead, Gordievsky agreed to the risky role of being a double agent and passing the Soviet secrets to MI6. He, however, had a few conditions for him to spy for them. The first was that he was not to be secretly photographed or recorded, second that his colleagues at the Copenhagen station were to be protected, and lastly that he wouldn't take any money. He was only operating from a sense of ideological conviction. MI6 gave him the codename Sunbeam, and Gordievsky was introduced to Philip Hawkins, his new handler. After serious scrutiny, the two agreed on a mode of operation that involved Hawkins flying to Copenhagen once a month. He would then spend a long weekend there, during which they would have two meetings of no less than two hours each. Hawkins then handed Gordievsky an emergency phone number, Secret Inc., and a London address which he could use to send urgent messages. For the next five years, he systematically dismantled and disclosed the intricate inner workings of the KGB. He routinely smuggled microfilm strips containing memos, instructions, letters, and other classified Soviet documents from the embassy during his lunch breaks. He would then secretly pass the films to his contact, which would appear as a mere brush against each other in a station, park, or street. MI6 had to tread cautiously with the information provided by Gordievsky. If they acted too swiftly or expelled KGB agents in masses, they would undoubtedly expose the presence of a mole. A mole that they couldn't afford to compromise since he held the distinction of being the highest ranking KGB officer to ever spy for the British. It was only a select number of MI6 and other intelligence personnel who knew Gordievsky's case, and the information he provided was meticulously sanitized before being shared beyond this circle. During this period, Gordievsky met young Leila Alieva, a typist for the World Health Organization. The two formed a bond, and so began Gordievsky's secret love affair. He continued living his double life until 1978, when he was recalled to Moscow. Although he didn't believe he had been compromised, he knew that if he was caught, it would be the end of his life. The MI6 offered him an opportunity to defect and stay in London under their protection, but he refuted the offer and returned to Russia. MI6 knew the time had come to devise a plan to rescue and withdraw their most prized asset should the need arise, and so Operation Pimlico was born. Never before had a KGB double agent been exfiltrated from within Russia, let alone from the heart of Moscow. Every single detail of the plan had to be perfect, because any mishaps would undoubtedly lead to the death of Gordievsky and those involved. Luckily, there was no need to execute the plan at the time. After returning to Russia, Gordievsky divorced Yelena and married Leila, a decision that struck a blow to his career prospects. This is because the KGB disapproved of extramarital affairs and divorces, considering them morally unacceptable. Ambitious KGB officers took advantage of this, hindering his promotion. At this point, he had no specific role within the service, but still set his sights on a transfer to KGB's British station and enrolled in English classes. During his lengthy stay in Moscow, it was too risky for him to send any information to MI6. However, the MI6 continued to act on what he had provided while stationed in Denmark, and the Soviet spies he had sold out were systematically rooted out from their positions. The KGB grew increasingly wary of a potential mole, causing Gordievsky to live in a constant state of apprehension, uncertain whether any tip-off or careless action might ultimately expose his true identity to the KGB. Luckily, he managed to survive this period unscathed, and then his lucky breakthrough came. A position in the Russian embassy in London opened up, and having finished his English classes, he became the perfect man for the job. In June 1982, the KGB finally posted him to London. MI6 changed his codename to Nocton, 
and handed him plenty of non-damaging contacts and information which, combined with MI6 also steadily banishing his direct superiors back to Moscow on trumped-up charges so that he could take their place, fueled his rapid advancement within the KGB ranks. The CIA had now become weary of MI6's high-level informant, but not his name or rank. To the CIA, Gordievsky was given the code name Tickle. His posting to the London station also coincided with Abel Archer 83, a NATO command post exercise that simulated DEFCON 1 procedures in case of a nuclear war strike. The KGB misinterpreted this exercise as a potential first strike, raising the tensions between the East and West to levels never seen after the Cuban Missile Crisis. However, working on intelligence provided by Gordievsky, this potential nuclear confrontation between the superpowers was averted. In April 1985, he was promoted to the KGB station chief in London at the Russian embassy. This was good news to MI6, as Gordievsky now had access to higher levels of Soviet secrets. However, in May 1985, a month after his promotion, Gordievsky was suddenly summoned back to Moscow. Again, the MI6 offered him the option to defect and stay in London under their watch. But he declined, citing that MI6 would reap even bigger benefits if he remained the station chief and left for Moscow. But unknown to him, Gordievsky had already been betrayed by CIA officer Aldrich Ames, who ironically only learned of him because the CIA had conducted a covert operation to discover who the source was, because the British wouldn't reveal him. Through the review of tip-offs and the process of elimination, Gordievsky had been identified as the likely suspect. On his arrival in Moscow on the 19th of May 1985, he was drugged and interrogated, but not yet criminally charged. This meant that though he was a suspect, the KGB didn't have enough evidence against him. He was informed that his position in the London station had been terminated, and he would never work abroad again. He was placed in a non-existent desk job in a non-operational department of the KGB and was always under strict surveillance. His wife and children were then transferred back to Moscow. Yet for some reason, his superiors stalled on taking any further actions from there. Knowing that it was only a matter of time before the KGB figured out his acts of espionage, Gordievsky activated Operation Pimlico. He knew the chances of making it out with his whole family under that much surveillance were next to nil. So he waited until Layla and his two daughters had left for their planned summer holidays before making his daring move. Following the plan, on Tuesday, July 16, 1985, he stood outside a designated bread shop in Moscow at 7.30 p.m. while holding a Safeway plastic bag and wearing a grey leather cap and a pair of grey trousers. A member of MI6 was on the lookout every Tuesday at that specific time to indicate that the signal had been received. The agent on duty walked past Gordievsky holding a green Harrods shopping bag, eating a Mars bar and wearing grey clothing. Brief eye contact was made and the agent continued walking. Three days after sending the signal, Gordievsky followed a careful process of losing his KGB trail before boarding an overnight train from Moscow to Leningrad and then a taxi to the Finland train station. He again boarded another train to Zelenogorsk from where he caught a bus heading towards the Finnish border and got off at a specific turnout spot, 16 miles south of a town called Vyborg. Two British diplomats and their wives, who served as his couriers, left Moscow in two vehicles with diplomatic license plates because they were less likely to be subjected to routine searches by Russian authorities at the border. At the meeting point, one of the officers opened the Ford Sierra saloon's trunk, signaling Gordievsky to emerge from hiding and enter the trunk. There was no talking as they knew that diplomatic cars were bugged. Gordievsky was provided with a heat reflective blanket to avoid detection by infrared cameras and heat detectors, along with sedative pills. In an attempt to deter sniffer dogs at the Finnish border, one of the wives strategically placed her baby's soiled diaper on the ground, which caused the dogs to quickly lose focus on his scent. He was then flown to the UK via Norway. And just like that, they had successfully executed the most audacious rescue mission in Cold War history, extracting a KGB colonel spy from behind the Iron Curtain. Back home, the KGB sentenced him to death in absentia for treason, but obviously that meant absolutely nothing. While he is a traitor to his motherland, he is a hero to the West, one who risked his life for the democratic freedoms we enjoy. Today, Gordievsky lives in an undisclosed location 
in the home counties of England under tight security. After all, he is Britain's greatest spy. Thank you for watching.